Okay, I'm joined today by Professor Ed Dutton. He's the host of the Jolly Heretic uh, YouTube channel, but also the author of a book called At Our Wit's End, which is about declining levels of intelligence. I thought I'd begin by asking Ed how he became interested in the topic of um, intelligence, which I, which I consider his primary intellectual concern. Hello, thank you for having me on. Um, I, I suppose I just gradually, I, I looked at various other areas. So I started off in religious studies and I looked at fundamentalist Christian student groups. And then from there, I looked at uh, Finnish culture. And I, and I just began to realize gradually that uh, genetics and genetic differences were fairly important in understanding what I was seeing. Uh, and this was something that we hadn't been taught about. Originally, I did a theology degree, and then I did religious studies in a divinity department. And we just weren't taught about the genetic component of anything. And so I realized about the importance of personality and the importance of intelligence, and that these factors were both uh, <clears throat> quite uh, heritable. And then I started to understand the, the significance of intelligence to differences between people and differences between groups. Uh, and then I became interested in selection for intelligence. And so that's how it began. It began with realizing that uh, um, a, 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 a simple and parsimonious explanation for some of the differences I was seeing was at least in part to do with things that were partly heritable, such as intelligence and personality. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that makes the book interesting is the combination of psychology, evolutionary psychology, social science, but then also history, interesting historical discussions, because it's not just about intelligence, it's also about the cyclical theory of history. So um, I, I was just going to begin by asking you how heritable intelligence is, because obviously there's this debate that goes on between um, pe people who believe that it's uh, largely uh, a product of nature and people who think it's largely a product of nurture. So so how heritable is intelligence? Well, it depends if you're talking about childhood or adulthood, because in childhood, your environment is created for you by other people, i.e. your parents. But in adulthood, you, you start to create an environment that is consistent with your own innate intelligence. Um, and so in adulthood, the heritability of intelligence uh, based on twin studies and twin adoption studies and things like this um, is somewhere in the region of point eight and maybe even a bit over point eight. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the heritability, so, yeah, in, to, to put it in sort of simpler terms, although it's not quite right, it's basically about 80 percent to do with genes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's, it's very, very strongly genetic. Um, and all, and you should, it should be emphasized that there are different subcomponents of intelligence. So intelligence is a bit like a pyramid. And at the base, you have things which are weakly associated with general intelligence, such as being able to do up your shoelaces or catch a ball or whatever. Um, these things are not particularly heritable. They're highly environmentally sensitive. And then you move a bit further up and you have the three, what you might call the three basic kinds of intelligence, linguistic, linguistic uh, mathematical and, uh, and, um, and spatial. And they intercorrelate. Uh, how good you are while it is related to how good you are on another. And so then at the pinnacle, you get G, general intelligence, the, the, the G factor. And it is this that is um, that is highly, highly heritable. Mm. And that's actually probably important to emphasize that throughout the book, I think you almost end up using the, the word G more than you do intelligence when you're referring because of that, that, of that specific definition. Um, so you, you talk about uh, the various selective pressures or, or types of, of selection that occur that actually promote intelligence. So these are natural selection, uh, sexual selection, and, and I believe social selection. And um, maybe you could just explain how each of these promote so, intelligence. So with, with natural, uh, with what you call natural selection or individual selection, if you have an environment which is, uh, which is harsh, harsh and stable, uh, then the carrying capacity for the species in the environment will be reached and therefore members of the species will be competing against each other and, th and there will be uh, difficult problems that they have to solve uh, in order to successfully compete against each other and to outcompete each other and to attain resources and so this will select in favor of intelligence and so if you if you uh, as, and so uh, <clears throat> this is this is this is the first factor so normally normally to some extent anyway a harsh environment will tend to select uh, and particularly will select in favor of intelligence and also a predictable environment because a big part of intelligence is being future oriented uh, mm -hmm. caring about the future planning for the future uh, uh, having what's called a low time preference 
And so those those those, those people will that, that will select for intelligence. In terms of sexual selection, <clears throat> um, women tend to sexually select for high status men. Um, and uh, high status, to some extent, tends, depending on the harshness of the society and how complex the society is, tends to be accrued at least partly via intelligence. And the correlation between intelligence and socioeconomic status is about uh, 0.5, something like that. The correlation um, between intelligence and education is even higher. The correlation between intelligence and how wealthy you are is about 0.4, 0.5. So women are sexually selecting for status, and by doing so, they are sexually selecting for for intelligence, um, and so therefore you, you have sexual selection for intelligence in uh, among uh, among men, um, and then at the and the and the and the children of the of the intelligent are more likely therefore to survive because they, in the ecology because they themselves will be intelligent. You also have uh, assortative um, mating, so that people tend to be sexually attracted to those that are genetically similar to them, and uh, so that they indirectly pass on more of their genes. Intelligence is highly genetic. Um, and therefore, and couples tend to be more genetically similar to each other on the more genetic traits. And so this means that um, these people that are highly intelligent, that are more likely to survive, are going to select wives for that reason alone that are more likely to be highly intelligent and more likely to survive. Um, and also, there's some relationship between intelligence and things like being pro-social, uh, uh, following the, the rules to some extent, uh, not cuckolding the man. And so you can see that a man would sexually select for intelligence. Uh, then you have... <clears throat> what you might call social selection. Uh, this is that if you are more intelligent, then you, there's to some extent you will get on better with people. If you get on better with people, you will have more access to resources. People will look after you. You'll be less likely to be cast out by the band and killed. Um, and so this selects for intelligence. Uh, for example, within the history of, of uh, medieval Europe, um, uh, all felonies were subject to the death penalty for uh, hundreds of years. And uh, this, this meant that we were killing about 2% of the male population every generation. Now, who were those 2%? They were young men, and they were probably low IQ young men as well. So mm. it was, it was, it was that, that social selection. And then above that, you have what we might call group selection, which is that all else being equal, a group that is more intelligent than another group is likely to, um, to, to uh, be more planful, more resourceful, better at warfare, better at producing weapons, um, and, and therefore all else being equal is likely to dominate the other group, take its territory, take its resources, destroy it. And then a, a nuance to that is that what is as important in terms of uh, groups fighting it out as the average intelligence of the group is the per capita level of genius that it produces. Um, and what are these geniuses? Well, it, to some extent, they are people with outlier high IQ, very high IQ, so compared to the group. So obviously, the more intelligent the group is, the more intelligent its geniuses are. Yeah. There's more to genius than that, but that, but that's that's a, a big uh, a big part of it. I and actually so want to all... talk about genius in a moment, but I thought I'd just <laughs> quickly interject because one of the things that I learned in this book, which I found interesting, was I can't remember the exact wording, but that in medieval England, uh, you could avoid execution by practicing like bishop's privilege or something. If you could read a passage from the Bible, you could avoid being executed. Is that right? Yes, benefit of the clergy. Right, so there right. are there are some interesting things like that, which also militate in favour of selecting for intelligence. You know, so as mm. I showed in the book, we were selecting for intelligence under harsh Darwinian conditions from the medieval era onwards, and particularly from uh, the end of the Black Death. Well, itself was a selection event for intelligence, mm. I think, but but because it killed about a third of the population, but it killed about eighty percent of the sort of working class of the time. So it was. We were every generation. We were bootstrapping the population. Every generation. It was the survival of the richest, as Gregory Clark has put it. Um, every generation, the richer fifty percent of the population had about double the completed fertility of the poorer fifty percent. A because they had access to better resources, and therefore any children they had would be have healthier, better food, whatever more likely to survive. And B because under selection. Um, things which are adaptive tend to co-correlate, tend to become player typically related. So intelligence is adaptive, we're selecting for that, So because that means that you're more likely to get resources, you're more likely to rise to the top of the society, you're more likely to get a female, you're more likely to um, pass on your genes. Um, but also other things that are adaptive, such as having a good immune system, so being genetically healthy, um, or, or um, 
would also be associated with intelligence. And so that because they become pleiotropically related because they're under selection together. And so therefore, across time, you're getting this situation where the, the population is being bootstrapped every generation. It, it is, every generation, is, it, was a, it was a society of, of social descent, where every generation, you people, people um, move down to fill the spaces which are left as the bottom rank of society just dies off, which mm. is interesting. It means that all of us native English people, including Australians, um, are um, descended from King Edward III for that reason. Yeah, um, I'll just summarise it. It, it. It's basically just under harsh Darwinian conditions, if, if we could call it that, um, the intelligent tend to survive, whilst the lowest IQ would constantly be essentially dying under those conditions. They would, be, they, they would find often that, like, that all their children would just die. Mm. Yeah. Um, and and they, 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 they would be the least healthy people in the society genetically in terms of health and mm. a specific relationship. They would also have the less the least access to resources, the worst living conditions. And so, of course, they, every gener and there'd be this competition. And so every generation, it would be th those at the bottom would die off and 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 there would be this gradual movement downwards all the time as the genes, as it were, from the original top of society spread. Uh, spread and spread until everybody is descended from the upper class of, of I don't know six or seven generations ago. Yeah. So if we if we look throughout history, uh, you give a sort of brief history of breeding habits, starting with hunter gatherers, and you you make your way all the way up to the eve of the industrial revolution. And basically, what 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 we can conclude is that um, under harsh conditions, education, intelligence and wealth are all positively correlated with fertility. So if you're smart, you're having more kids than people who are stupid. More surviving kids, more surviving yeah. kids. More surviving point, children. Yeah. Yes. And then there are other interesting things as well that we're selecting in favour of intelligence. So, for example, what you said about what was what's those benefit of the clergy. Mm -hmm. So, if you were um, if you were uh, educated and being educated correlated in that in that time with being in intelligent because um, what because socioeconomic status of that you're born into itself correlates with intelligence. And so, those people that are criminals but are intelligent, they get off. Mm -hmm. they, they they don't get hanged. It's only it's only the it's only the it's the really unintelligent criminals that that, that, that get executed. Another thing was that okay, it was a monogamous society, uh, but until the really the end of the 16th century and the rise of Puritanism, there was de facto polygamy mm -hmm. among the upper class. Yeah. So many many of these gentry and whatever had as many illegitimate children by mistresses as they had legitimate ones. Yeah. And so this. Skews, it skews the complete fertility even further in 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 um in the direction of the more intelligent. Well, I obviously knew about th that. I knew that I knew that um, illegitimacy was a fairly common thing, but I was surprised because you you actually were able to give some data just just the the prevalence of it that I I can't remember the, num the numbers off the top of my head, but it's much more prevalent illegitimacy than I than I would have thought among the higher members of of um. Yeah, English medieval society. I was genuinely surprised it's by very that. Very substantial. So, from what mm. I can work out, your your leader of the opposition, Peter Dutton, mm. um, who is a distant relative of mine, um, <laughs> he 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 comes from an illegitimate line mm. of my of my medieval knightly family. Mm. Uh, yeah. And and so it, it's it's um it's 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 very it was very very common. Yeah, yeah, very common, which is interesting. Um, you mentioned a moment ago. A genius, and I. Uh, this was another part of the book that I found very interesting. Um, so, so obviously, a genius has a high IQ, but that's obviously not sufficient, right? It's it's not just a high IQ; it's something else. Can you describe what that something else is? Well, one way of summarizing it is Satoshi Kanazawa summarized it like this: that basically, it's the it's the personality of a criminal mm. plus very high IQ, yeah. whereas a criminal. Is the personality of a criminal plus low IQ normally? Yes. So it's it's outlier high intelligence plus moderately psychopathic traits, mm. subclinical psychopathology, and perhaps also autism, elements of autism, elements of ADHD, uh, elements of neuroticism and mental illness. Mm. Now these things at the group level are normally negatively associated with intelligence, not perhaps autism, but the other things, psychopathology, mm. maybe. And so these it, it, it are very unlikely genetic combinations that will come up by just like genetic chance, which is why, of course, they tend not to breed true in the children. 
Mm. So a lot of these geniuses that you might know of, like Charles Darwin or whatever, they come from highly intelligent parents. They have highly intelligent children, but they, but those, the children, the parents are not geniuses. Mm. It's unlikely genetic combinations that, that are that are thrown up. And that seems to be basically very high intelligence plus moderately su subclinical psychopathic traits. And what that means is that um, being relatively low in agreeableness, i.e. altruism and empathy, uh, and thus hard, uh, you either don't care, your new ideas will offend against best interest, they will rock the boat. Hmm. But you either don't care about that, or you actually quite enjoy rocking the boat and stirring things up. Mm. Um, or you're too autistic to understand that your idea will rock the boat because you're low in empathy. Mm. In, uh, and so in the other kind of empathy. And so therefore you don't care about rocking the boat so you will rock, or you don't understand that you will do so, so you will rock the boat. Now the other personality trait, subclinical psychopathology is rule following, what we call conscientiousness. Yeah. Now if you're relatively low in rule following, you can think outside the box, you can think the unthinkable. A lot, a lot of people are, 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 are certain things they just can't even comprehend thinking because to do so would be to break certain social rules that, that they've imposed upon themselves. You break those rules. You you go there. Mm. So that's another factor. Another factor with with neuroticism that is to say feeling negative feelings strongly, uh, things like depression and anxiety. Um, if you experience the world as a sort of swirling dangerous chaos then you desperately want to understand it and make sense of it. It soothes you, it calms you down to do so. If you are an anxious person, you are worrying all the time, then what that also means is you are thinking all the time and you are, you are, you, you are potentially generating um, ideas. Um, and so I think it's, it's these, these factors together that mean when combined with extremely high intelligence, which means that then you, you come up with a sort of a, 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 a genius idea, a, 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 a real sort of breakthrough. They're, they're a very specific and rare uh, kind of person. Yeah, because uh, when I was reading the book, initially one of the things I, uh, I sort of took to task was you talk about intelligence and how obviously when you're looking at pre-industrial societies, you can't gauge intelligence by looking at IQ tests because they don't exist. So you say, look, uh, intelligence correlates with low corruption, with a variety of other things mm. and um like low criminal behavior low corruption etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and we can basically gauge intelligence by looking at these other metrics but i took issue with that because i thought think about elizabethan england which was obviously the the english renaissance right that was a time that was extremely high in corruption but then what you just said about intelligence and sorry uh what you just said about genius um I actually think it can give us insight into golden eras because if you look at whether it be Renaissance Italy or or the Elizabethan England, they're typically time, times that are high in this criminal type. This um so, so there's high levels of corruption. There's and and even the genius like you think think about people like um Francisco de Goya or, or people like this like the, these painters who have these intense criminal tendencies. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. What do you What do you think about? I that? think that's a, I think that's a very good point. I think there's an optimum. I, I think I, I think I look at this in in, in Adar Witz, and I certainly looked at it in other books. There is an optimum balance that has to be struck. So, what in order to have genius, you have to have sufficient um, subclinical psychopath, autistic, whatever, basically antisocial mm. genes floating around in the gene pool. Yeah. Um, for them for them to manifest occasionally. Now, with some societies, with some peoples, and I did a, a study on this with my Japanese colleague, Ken Yukura, um, and we tried to understand why is it that the Japanese are more intelligent than Europeans. They have an IQ of about 107 compared to our, our, our average IQ of about a, of 100. So what, but if you look at their level of per capita genius, uh, mm -hmm. their level of per capita Nobel Prizes or whatever, their level of Fields Medals or whatever you want to look at, it is way lower than is the case among Western mm -hmm. Europeans. It is down on a par with places like Romania that have an IQ of sort of 85, something like that. So what what is going on? There's a number of factors and one of them relates to what you were saying. The first is that because they are, they have, they are subject to a harsher selection regimen, they are, okay, they've moved south since, but they were originally evolved to a very cold, very harsh ecology mm. in which if you're not precisely adapted to the area, then you just die. So the result of that is that there is a narrow gene pool. 
mm. which means there's not much rue. It's, it's it's more difficult for like random unlikely combinations to happen because it's a it's a much narrower gene pool. Secondly, um, the flip side of the of the genius of the highly intelligent um, uh, subclinical psychopath is like the the waste of time dreamer or the criminal or whatever. Now, in a society like that, in in order to survive, you've got to be highly group oriented. You've, mm. It's a, it's a harsh ecology. You have to be able to get to be part of a group and stay part of a group and get on with people. You can't be on the borders of a group or whatever. So it's gonna it's gonna select out strongly select out people that have psychopathic traits. And under group selection, very harshly, uh, what what predicts uh, uh, survival is is um, high positive and negative ethnocentrism. You can't have people that deviate from that, that are uncooperative. You'll get killed. So they are selected out. And so basically the East Asians are not psychopathic enough. Yeah, they're not psychopathic enough, and so and, and that's that's that, that's the second problem. Um, and so therefore they 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 they, uh, they they don't have outliers in terms of intelligence. That's the first thing. And the second thing is they don't have these psychopaths. And the third thing is they they certainly don't have the likelihood of the psychopathology and the outlier high IQ combining. And mm. so that's probably true that you have to get that balance right and and uh, 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 an, opt an optimum level of an optimum low level. Of psychopathology in the society is necessary to create genius. Too much, and the society is uncooperative; it doesn't get very far. But mm. but uh, but but too little, and you have a society like Japan or indeed Finland, which is a similar thing, which is that the Finns are more intelligent than the British, for example, but very low levels of per capita genius. Yeah, well, it would also explain. I'm going to misquote Ebola, but he has this idea. It's like, um, basically, like the highest point of a civilization is always just before the decline. And I think basically what you do have in, in like a Renaissance Italy, for for example, is this, and um, you could know ancient Greece as well, the like the, the spreading of this sort of criminal type. Um, and, I, and I mean that figuratively rather than literally, but then I also mean that literally, right? So, so you have these people who are, like, in order to participate in philosophy, obviously you, you need to be alienated from custom and you need to almost be borderline criminal in your thinking, which you said before. But if, if you, so, so you look at um, the, the Athenian golden age, right? You have tons of these people on a per, per capita basis. It's probably never happened before at such a rate, but that happens just before the, 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 the decline of that society, because obviously it's unsustainable to have that many um, criminal philosopher types or genius types going around. It's actually also those people, those people, the, 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 the negative side of that is those people start questioning or, or people of that kind, um, mm. not necessarily geniuses, semi geniuses, uh, whatever you want to call them, anti geniuses, mm. start questioning the, the, the society, start acting in a way that is detrimental to the good of the group. They start questioning everything that holds it together. Um, and, and 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 the things which which give it a sense of confidence and so forth. So that that's also a problem. But I think that with with the Renaissance, I do think that the, the significant thing was the Black Death. That was the big thing because that would have been a massive selection event. About a third of Europe, or maybe even half, it depends who you ask, uh, were were killed. Uh, but it was eighty percent of the serfs and free laborers. Mm. So the, the, basically, the, the 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 lower classes of the society were just destroyed. Um, and and this would have bootstrapped the entire population and rendered everybody, every social class, much, much, much more intelligent. And it also allowed for rapid social movement so that all of the like people that were born by unlikely genetic chance, but it does happen, into the lower classes but were highly intelligent were able to move up very quickly mm -hmm. in that in that chaos. There was a lot of social movement. And so I think it's no coincidence that you have this massive plague um, and then, and then uh, about a few generations later, you have the what well, you, you have the Renaissance, so mm. about hundred years later, and, and, and similarly, like even in Finland, in 1698, a third of the Finnish population died in a in a big plague, um, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that hundred years later you have like the Finnish national awakening. Yeah, um, these these things I think are, are, can be partly explained in terms of changes in the nature of the people. Okay, so maybe we'll move on now. We'll segue into talking about um, basically dysgenics, but. Um, so, so, so we've established that in pre-industrial Europe, um, intelligence and fertility are positively correlated. And, and you've got all the numbers in the book to back that up. Um, you look at wills and other things like that. But um, after the Industrial Revolution, 
that actually flips on its head and becomes inverted, where we see that um, education, intelligence are actually negatively correlated with fertility. Could you speak a little bit about that? Well, o only only weakly, but yes, that, that is the case. So you have this situation of half Darwinian uh, selection pressure, uh, then you have the, and the child mortality rate is about 50%. Mm. Uh, now, gradually, by about the 1880s it, in England, it's 10%. Mm. So you, you've got to say, well, what, what has that, what has that, because of inoculations, because of better access to food, better living conditions, all of the fruits of the Industrial Revolution. So what that means is that who, the people that were dying off overwhelmingly every generation, the, 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 the population was being purged of, mm. of, uh, of mutant genes, of genes which basically made you sickly, of, of, of a mutational load. Um, mm. And that correlated it with, with it being purged of people that would have low IQ, uh, uh, of people that would have had, I don't know, like personality disorders, uh, because th there is a strong relationship between having um, uh, problems with the mind, uh, genetic problems of the mind, and genetic problems of the body. There's basically mm. a fitness factor that we can talk about, a fitness factor because of pleiotropy, where all of these things, intelligence, uh, being physically fit, being mentally fit, they all co they all co correlate into a fitness factor, and we had very strong harsh selection to ensure a strong fitness factor into about 1800 and then after that quite quickly the the selection on that fitness factor collapsed um and 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 so and so just for that reason alone we became uh, less and less fit across time uh, until by about 1900 there's evidence based on education as a proxy that there was no longer a, a relationship no longer a correlation between socioeconomic status and how many surviving children you had and by about the 1920s in England it was negative mm. And and at the moment it's something like minus point one or minus point two. It's weak. It's weakly negative, but it is um, it is negative, uh, and it and it, it and it seems to be a, a, a genetic thing. And the there's good evidence for that because um, <clears throat> since I wrote that book in 2018, uh, there's been a lot of progress on genomes and and uh, polygenic scores and things like this. You know, and and so you're yeah, finding the genes for things, and we have. Uh, genes, polygenic scores that are associated with basically with very high intelligence, with um, with, with being like having a PhD or whatever. So with very mm. high intelligence, and uh, and those g those genes, um, those alleles increased in Europe from me the medieval period up to about the nineteenth century, um, and then since then they have been in decline. And th th there was a study from Iceland which showed that across three generations, the prevalence of those alleles in the, nice, in the native Icelandic population has decreased, which is consistent with, with dysgenics on intelligence. And we've, we know um, from other studies, which again came out after I published that book, I've got another book that's just on dysgenics, called, uh, it's called Breeding the Human Herd, Eugenics, Dysgenics and the Future of the Species, um, which looks at this in more detail. Um, so yeah, we have, we have dysgenics on intelligence and we have dysgenics on, on everything else as well. We are, we, we are becoming um, uh, sicker and sicker and sicker every generation. And mm. there's other facts as well which make that worse, but, but other sociological factors. But, yeah. but, it's, but, but just removing the selection pressure has, has done that. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so the selection pressure, um, the selection pressure begins to lessen, and then yes, we can see declines in and things like intelligence. That makes sense. Um, some of those mechanisms that you, you talk about it in the book are well. There's the obvious fact that you point out, which is that obviously educated, intelligent women in our society are encouraged to spend as long as possible at university. Which means by the time they start thinking about having kids, um, they're already in their early 30s or at the very least late 20s, which means the amount of children that they can actually have is is pretty limited. So that's mm -hmm. obviously a sort of disjunct. And also, and then the, at the other end of the scale, you've got the girl that drops out of school at 16, has many, many uh, children by many men, um, and she's becoming a grandmother by the time her, her more intelligent uh, classmate is becoming a mother so it's not just more children it's more generations mm, absolutely so, and you so, mentioned in yeah. it as well there was a book you mentioned which i can't remember off the top of my head but it was about welfare and it, it was this or maybe it wasn't a book maybe the welfare it was, uh, trait the welfare trait by Andy yeah Burton. could you talk about that that i found that interesting so what that what that found so that another factor which militates in favor of um 
of dysgenics on intelligence is welfare, um, because it's been he what he shows uh, Adam Perkins um, is that if you divide society between like uh, families where both parents are working, they have average IQ. Families where one parent is on welfare, families where both parents are on welfare, or families where both parents are on welfare and they're like the criminal underclass. You know, you have to have the police involved and social workers involved and, and things like that. Only that latter group has above replacement fertility. So, so um, this means, and and the group differences tend to be on G. They, they, it's called the Jensen effect. They, they, they tend to be on uh, on 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 G. So it's almost certainly genetic. The, the differences in intelligence are going to be genetic between these kinds of groups, and so that's what's being selected for. Very very low IQ is what has above replacement fertility in, uh, well, certainly in Britain and New Zealand, where I've, I've seen studies. Mm. Um, and so, uh, and so, uh, and it, he shows in the book that these people, okay, they're not very intelligent, but they're intelligent enough to game the system. Mm. So they deliberately have more children because it means that they get in, put in a bigger council house or they get more money and they get more money per child and they don't have to spend that money on the children. They can spend it on whatever they want to spend it on. I think that so, you mentioned in the book that I don't know if you know the numbers off the top of your head. But it was something like a three percent increase in welfare expenditure could be attributed to a one percent increase in the fertility of the underclass, something like that. I mean, yes, yeah, so, so he does. It, it, Perkins did the calculations. Yeah, that's that's right. It's something like that. But he demonstrates that it is causal. So welfare okay. is causal in reducing the IQ of the native population. Obviously, another problem is immigration. Um, the, the immigrants that, that tend not to come into uh, Western countries tend to have lower average IQ than the natives. This reduces the IQ of the society and also it reduces the IQ at the environmental level because then suddenly the schooling has to take into account let lower IQ kids and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it reduces it at the environmental level. Um, another another factor is... Um, uh, Oh, the, oh, it's just contraception that people that are more intelligent are more able to use contraception. They're more willing to use contraception. They, 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 they have greater impulse control, so they're more likely to use it and whatever and use it properly. And a, a big factor just seems to be, and this is something that I think, you, you, as I said in the book, that you see evidence of at the height of Rome, at the height of Greece, um, Athens, is that at a certain level of luxury, people just stop wanting children. Mm. Uh, at, a, at a certain level of materialism, there's a number of studies on this. It, um, if the thing that makes people want to have children is living in their evolutionary match, and our evolutionary match is to be surrounded by death. Mm. And many studies show that if you pri that mortality salience, or even just priming people with mortality salience, so making them think of death, makes them want to have more children. Mm. And if you prime people with the opposite, with materialism and comfort and whatever, they want to have fewer children. Priming them with death doesn't just make them want to have more children. They want to have more children. They regard children as less expensive, and they want to name children after themselves to a greater extent in order to attain a kind of symbolic immortality. Mm. Yeah, so see. take them, take people out of their evolutionary match. They don't want to have children. Now there's some evidence that intelligence is associated with being environmentally sensitive. People that are intelligent are more environmentally sensitive, which makes sense because part of intelligence is that you're not instinctive. You can rise above your instincts and carefully and logically solve the problem. So you're less instinctive, you're less hardwired, there's more built into you, there's less built into you. And that implies that an intelligent person, to a greater extent than a less intelligent person, needs to be sort of placed upon the precise evolutionary roadmap of life. And that's consistent with the discussion that we had, the thing we were talking about earlier, about why we select for intelligence and in what environments you select for intelligence. You select for intelligence in a harsh and difficult environment. And in that environment, you have to really like nurture your children and you, you and, and have a long childhood and find a niche to survive in, and problems to solve. Whereas in an easy environment, you can just be instinctive and just sort of, it's just all built into you. Mm. Um, and so, um, and so it seems that intelligent people are more environmentally sensitive and therefore they are more likely to not want to have children, to, to suffer dysphoria and not want to have children in an evolutionary mismatch. And we are increasingly in an evolutionary mismatch, i.e. we're not evolved, we're evolved to be surrounded by death and suffering and struggle. And, um, and if, you, if you take that away, then you, that you, 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 you have this dysphoria and you just sort of go mad, basically. And mm. that, that seems to be what's what's going on. I I find it interesting actually that in Australia and in Botswana, no, sorry, in Namibia, they've taken the Aboriginals in the case of Australia and the Bushmen in the case of Namibia, and they've put them on these reservations. 
Um, and it just sort of sends them mad. Mm. Because they're, they're they're not in their evolutionary match. That 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 they're in some strange evolutionary mismatch, like being in a zoo. Mm. And it sends them mad. And 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 this is what we've done to ourselves via yes. um, the industrial revolution. Yeah. Well, I was actually going to say, like so many other things, it's this mismatch between our psychology and our environment, or our nature and our environment, which leads to a whole host of pathologies uh a quote from the book that i found pretty powerful and i think a lot of people will uh, listening will find this pretty powerful as well i'm just going to read it to you and maybe you can just talk about it afterwards is the academics of the year 2000 were the school teachers of 1900 the school teachers of the year 2000 would have been the factory workers the average people of 1900 the office workers and policemen of the year 2000 were the farm laborers of 1900 those who were around 10 to 15 IQ points below average at the time. The low level security guards and shop assistants of the year 2000 were probably in the workhouse, on the streets, or dead in 1900. The substantial, long term, unemployed or unemployable, the dependent underclass of the year 2000 simply didn't exist in 1900. That's one of those quotes where I read that. And it very much uh, stuck with me and, and pops into my head from time to time. Um, because I, I feel like, you know, maybe you, you end up talking to a teacher or talking to, yeah, someone where you would expect a certain degree of intelligence and you realize, hang on a second. Yeah, like you said, this person would have been a factory worker a uh, hundred years ago. Um, yeah, do you want to just talk to that quote? Well, that quote actually originally is from a book I did with Bruce Charlton called The, the Genius Famine. But uh, yeah, that's that's certainly true. But we, there are a number of ways that in the app, because IQ tests were developed around about sort of 1910, something like that. And so there are a number of ways that we can work out, a number of proxies that we can look at by which we can realise that intelligence has been going down since about sort of 1870, something like that. Per capita genius is one, per capita major innovation, uh, uh, colour discrimination. There's various, lots and lots of them, and they're all in the same direction. But one of them is reaction times. Uh, reaction times, uh, how quickly you respond to stimuli, correlate with uh, intelligence at something like 0.3. And uh, based on that, we, were, uh, my colleague Michael Woodley and, and his colleagues were able to extrapolate that we lost something like 15 points between 1880 and the year 2000. And so, and 15 points is, as I say, it's, it's one standard deviation and it's approximately the difference between a, a policeman or whatever, an average person um, uh, and a, 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 a school science teacher or something like that. Um, and that's the year 2000. I mean, that's now that's 25 years ago almost. So we 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 would have lost a couple. We would have lost maybe two or three points since then, because mm. on, on on some estimates we're losing about a point per uh, per decade. Um, and um, so uh, obviously this has a significant effect at the at the tail end. It means if if you uh, lose just a few points, you know, you're you're halving the number of geniuses. You're halving the number of people of the original genius standard, um, and you're increasing substantially the the underclass, those that have an IQ of, of below eight, below eighty or or, some, or something like that. So so it has very very serious consequences, and it potentially has serious consequences for the functioning of society because you have more and more and more people making more and more piss poor decisions all the time. Mm. Um, such that you could imagine that a country like India, yeah, you get very intelligent people that live in India, mainly because of the caste system, which forces people that are of high intelligence to marry other people of high intelligence. You know, about 95% of Indians marry not just, or more than that even, marry not just within caste, but within jat, i.e. within sub-caste. Mm. So, so, so the result of that is that every generation, people that are, you, you can't get a situation where, I don't know, a very intelligent man marries his secretary or something. Mm. That's not going to happen. It's this, it's this funneling, such that the heritability of intelligence in India is not 0.8, which it is in the West, it's 0.9, it's even mm. higher. So, um, you, uh, yeah, so what the result is you just get more and more chaos, more and more things not working, more and more things falling apart. And even those comparisons that I just, that I gave in that quote, um, they don't take other things into account. So they don't take into account that, like, the expansion of higher education since, uh, even since the year 2000, but certainly since um, the Victorian era, has been enormous. So the the university professor 
back then, he was very, very intelligent, very, very elite, much less so now. Now that 50% of people go to university, there's all these rubbish university lecturers that aren't very bright and, and, and have professorships. Or the expansion of education since then, so the school teacher. Now everybody goes to school and goes to school in, in England anyway till the age of 18. So there's more school teachers. So the standard of school teacher is lower. Or the fact that it used to be that women, for example, uh, could not really go into any profession above school teacher. So you'd get highly intelligent women that were capable of being lawyers or doctors when I was at school, who'd be school teachers. Well, their equivalent now were lawyers or doctors. Mm. So, the, so the, the, the standard of the teaching profession collapses. Um, there was a study I read, um, that has um, in a preprint at the moment that indicates that the average IQ of a graduate is about 102. Mm. So not that different from the average IQ. So yeah, it, it changes the nature of society. And I, and I think we are seeing that. We are seeing that play out in all kinds of ways, in the obsession with sex, in, in lower social trust, in, um, uh, in, in lots of little things going wrong, uh, you know, the, the, the collapse of the, of, of the, that, of, was it Champlain Towers in, in uh, Miami? It was, it was just stupidity. Uh, and, and, you, and you'll see lots and lots of things like that going on. Yeah, so I read um, a while ago, I read this book by Steven Pinker, Enlightenment Now, and he's sort of making obviously the opposite case. But um, in that book, he mentions the Flynn effect, which is obviously suggesting that IQ is increasing. Um, but you sort of take the Flynn effect to task in this book. So maybe you could just explain. I don't know how I take it to task. I mean, I knew I corresponded with Jim Flynn and you, you see that he was one of the dust jacket quotes for my book was was Jim Flynn. So mm. um, uh, uh, Jim Flynn completely accepted that we were right about this. Oh, the, right. Flynn effect, the, the Flynn effect was not a matter of intelligence increasing. It was a matter of IQ increasing. Mm. And they are not the same thing because the IQ test the the instrument is not a perfect measurer of intelligence mm -hmm. it also measures other things and so when i i say uh, personality traits things like that it's not a perfect measure of g and so when i said earlier that intelligence is a bit like a pyramid and at the base of that pyramid you have these specialized abilities that are weakly associated with with g well one of those specialized abilities is uh, basically, it's a kind of analytical ability. It's a, the the ability to perceive similarities, yeah. and what Flynn argued that was was that us living in an increasingly scientific society, it's like forced everybody to think in a more analytical way, yeah. um, and that has made the, everybody better at similarities. And so what happened is that there was this massive rise in our scores on similarities, on, I, on the subtest similarities on IQ tests from the 1930s onwards, or even before that. And the rise was so enormous and so quick that it overwhelmed everything else that was happening on the IQ test, all of the other measures, and it came across as a secular IQ rise. But that's not the same as intelligence rising, because that uh, subtest is only weakly associated with G, and it's highly environmentally sensitive. So the environment was changing all the time, making people better and better and better at similarities. And this continued until we reached our phenotypic maximum on similarities, which occurred round about the generation born in about 1980. And then you start to see a negative Flynn effect, i.e. The, the, the fall in intelligence. IQ scores start to go down. And that, of course, is not on, at least at first it's not on, similarities. They're at their phenotypic maximum. It's everything else. It's like, it's like the similarities were cloaking what was happening under the surface. And what was happening under the surface was declines in everything else. Mm. Um, and, and, that, and that decline is on G is on general intelligence, which is highly genetic, i.e. the decline is what's called a Jensen effect it's on the most genetic components of the IQ battery. So um, it was, a, it, it was it's a strange thing, the Flynn effect, and it has real world impacts. I mean, if people are better at analytics, then it has real world impacts in terms of abilities and things they can do. Um, but it, it, it was not betokening a, a rise in intelligence. It was it was it was a, it was a consequence of, of the imperfect nature uh, of the IQ test. And as I say, I wrote, I've written a number of papers on the negative Flynn effect, and 
all of which I think were peer reviewed by Jim Flynn himself, actually. And uh, the because he used to style his reviews. And uh, yeah, this is this seems to be on G and it's consistent with all of the other effects, the other so called Woodley effects uh, that we have that, uh, that uh, intelligence is in decline and, and has been since the mid 19th century. Yeah, so even if you accept like the, the Flynn effect that I that IQ was rising, which isn't the same as intelligence, that IQ was rising, even now the Flynn effect is there's a negative Flynn effect. The IQ scores are going down now. IQ so, scores are going down, yeah, yeah, yes, in, right, in well, Western uh, countries. So, so as I said at the beginning of this conversation, what I think makes this book interesting is the, is the unique combination of, of psychology, social science, evolutionary psychology, but then history, because obviously you are a historian. Um, and I found this commentary on uh, the cycle theory of history very interesting. Um, so, so essentially, we, just to kind of summarize what's been said so far before we move on we can recognize that as a society develops as it becomes wealthy as happened in europe throughout europe after the industrial revolution um we can see that fertility and intelligence do start to become negatively correlated as, as the elite become more comfortable um they have less children which um is obviously somewhat dysgenic this idea that we've been discussing um, seems to support the cyclical view of history. Um, so, so do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it, it supports a cyclical view. Yeah, society is under half Darwinian conditions. The half Darwinian conditions select for intelligence. The intelligence results in um, eventually in a, a portion of society being geniuses and whatever. The geniuses create the, the, the fruit of the fruit of civilization. Um, and then civilization reduces environmental harshness, mm. um, and 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 this um, and this can be seen in Rome with the, the 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 grain laws and the dole and plumbing and underfloor heating and whatever. It can be seen in Athens, and it can be seen in an even more extreme way um, in the West. It reduces environmental harshness, um, and the result of that is uh, is that uh, the the selection against intelligence. Uh, weakens and weakens and weakens and weakens, and then eventually certain things happen, which, uh, sorry, the selection in favour of intelligence weakens and weakens and weakens and weakens because you get more and more people surviving and living and having children that aren't very intelligent. Um, but then also you get you get changes in 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 how people operate. You 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 get you get a, a broader sort of dysgenic process, I think. Um, which means that the nature of the people the, the nature of the people starts to change, um, and they become. Uh, much more uh, because they're 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 less up against it, and the, the, the mortality salience is is very very low. Then the intelligent people basically stop having children and resign from the gene pool, um, and um, and uh, because of this dysphoria as well that mentioned earlier, um, and and then you just you become less and less and less and less and less intelligent. I think there are other factors beyond intelligence that are also at play. Um, so I think that the the modal personality of the society starts to change so um, I, look, I look at this mud book breeding the human herd so you you get a you get a situation where uh, everything you you get a sort of a, a rise up of people who are high in mental instability essentially uh, who would have been selected out because mental instability goes together with low intelligence and it goes together with poor genetic health but you get more and more people like that and then those people sort of shift the society over um, into into being concerned with equality and 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 uh, harm avoidance as opposed to group oriented values because that's what they're concerned with because if there's evidence that if you're high in mental instability and you're physically weak then how do you get status you you play for status covertly by sort of virtue signaling and going on about equality and obviously if you're low in status and or if you see yourself as low in status you have low self esteem you will militate in favour of equality because you'll that will be the way you'll see as getting more of, of the of the wealth and uh, that will be your instinct. Uh, and and uh, and harm because avoid harm to yourself and so then it tips over and you, and they, these people start they they they're full of 
hatred and jealousy and they start questioning everything, absolutely everything. So they start questioning the religion of the society in particular. That starts to be starts to be questioned, and the and the religion tends to uphold that which is evolutionarily adapted as the will of God, and that's all torn down. And so you get the same thing it happens again and again and again. It happens in in Athens. It happens in Rome. It happens in Baghdad. The religion starts to be questioned. Patriarchy starts to be questioned. Uh, everything the religion upholds starts to be questioned. Uh, eth ethnocentrism starts to be questioned, uh, and, and people become more and more and more um, individualistic and and just obsessed with base things, sex and pop stars and 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 and, and stuff like this. And 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 there's less and, and then uh, and and then you just sort of uh, uh, balkanize and fall apart and collapse. Um, and and this this process occurs in a very similar way as Sir John Glubb, uh, Pasha Glubb, points out in his book *The Fate of Empires*. Again and again, again and again and again, you get the same process. Even down to the minutiae, like the accept acceptability of homosexuality, um, everything is questioned. Rise of individualism and equality, um, as as the nature of the people changes to being from being basically conservative to being to being liberal. And there's almost certainly a genetic component to that change, um, uh, which, uh, and I look at that in my book, my successor book to Add Our Wits End, The Past, the Future Country, The Coming Conservative Demographic Revolution. Mm. Yeah, the the thing that I've kind of, the, the dystopia that I guess I've feared the most is that somehow through technology, like technology such as AI, um, we will be able to essentially ride out the winter or, or, or we could somehow live in a sort of perpetual winter because for, for, for whatever reason what i'm trying to get at is the cyclical view of history perhaps it won't apply because we'll have technology such as ai which means that a society that otherwise would have collapsed is able to perpetuate itself but for much much longer than you would expect and then we would find ourselves in a situation like what was depicted in the movie wally -E, you know where you have these oh well anyway if you haven't seen the movie wally -E, it, it, it's like um they're living on some space uh station and there, there's a sort of ai um commander sort of thing and the people are extremely obese they they, they move around on these um these um anyway but basically it's like this highly consumerist society the people don't need to think for themselves whatsoever they mm. they are tra they're so fat that they can't even walk but they're, they're transported around by these floating seats. And um, yeah, do you fear that at all? That, that Or, or do you, are you pretty convinced that industrial society will inevitably end up collapsing because we won't have the necessary IQ to support it? Um, well, I think that we could, I mean, we're living at the moment, we just, it's a, in many ways an awful time to live. So first of all, you have the new industrial revolution of the internet. And then you've just got used to that, and then you have another social revolution brought about by um, smartphones and 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 you know YouTube and social media and things like that. And then you're just getting used to that. And now we're going to have the AI one, and I think it is going to have dramatic consequences. And we're just we're just at the beginning of it. But uh, one possibility is the, the the more the more complex the system is, the more fragile it is. Mm, so the first, the first possibility is that you could have. Well, what happens if you have an AI virus, mm. and and it could be cleverer than any virus ever, mm. and 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 it could just bring everything shattering down, and then we just lose confidence in technology, and that's that's one possibility that, that could happen. Um, another possibility is that. AI itself is a selection event, and I don't think that's that improbable. That you're going to get at the moment. I, I'm writing a book at the moment called Woke Eugenics, which is going to be published with an Australian publisher, actually, as, as it happens, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the same publisher that published Breeding the Human Herd. And I'm saying that wokeness is a selection event. It basically puts people on the maladaptive roadmap of life, and the only people that are resistant to that, at least among the more intelligent, are going to be those that are conservative and religious and whatever for genetic reasons so it's almost like selecting for a right-wing fundamentalist people that's what mm. we're to do, selection event now i think that you could argue that uh, ai does that to an even more pronounced degree because who are the kind of people that are going to be content to have ai girlfriends and to do a kind of vanilla sky um entry into a into a false universe where everything's perfect or or, or, or whatever so, so this this becomes a selection event 
Uh, it, it, it removes all these people from the gene pool who are going to be of a certain kind. Mm. Um, so I don't think I don't I don't think it necessarily um, uh, uh, keeps society on on life support. And, and if it in that way, and 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 if it does, eventually, eventually, because the it's not the, this, there is the cyclical model of civilization. Fine, and that does work with Athens and Baghdad and the West. I think. Um, and and Rome, uh, not so much with. Um, well, it could be argued that the real thing that brought that really brought down Rome was the Great Justinian Plague, mm. and it getting really cold. And similarly, it could be argued that the thing that brought down the the, uh, the 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 late Bronze Age collapse was the eruption of Krakatoa or something like that. Mm. So um, eventually, something will happen. I mean, in 1859. On, on the 1st of September, we have what's called a Carrington event, where there was a massive solar flare that hit the Earth. It was so enormous that there was a roar of borealis as far south as the tropics, and the electricity system of the time was knocked out. Uh, the telegraph operators were burned. The paper caught fire. Mm. Now, imagine if we had a, a, um, a Carrington event now that knocked out the Earth's electricity system now, then, well, the electricity system was meager, it was it was, it was was in its in its infancy, but now we'd be thrown back to the Stone Age. Mm. So there's also something like um, like like that that could uh, that could that could occur and that could wipe the whole thing out. So um, I'm, I'm not I'm I think there are many there. It's possible. Yeah, that it could just keep people going on sort of life, life, life support, but it would also be a selection event. So it would, it would, it would, it, it would. I think it would ultimately. I, uh, I suspect th th that it would bring down society as we know it, if not plunge us back to to uh, a, an earlier stage. Sorry. Yeah, I think about the cyclical view of history as like it, it's clear that um, modern man is in a way alienated from from the seasons in a way because you can mitigate the against the winter through technology like air like air conditioners like you know heaters and, and i'm trying to go into the symbolism here it, it's clear that uh technology is doing something similar where obviously right now um we're able to mitigate against elements of decline because of technology people who wouldn't exist do exist because of technology but um like you said that 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 is fragile it's complicated it's complex it's fragile and it wouldn't take much. And I mean, the book does begin, you begin with um, the story of the, the Concord, right? Which is in some ways relevant to what we're talking about now. Maybe you could just go into that, you know? Well, yeah, Concord was grounded by basically one stupid mistake made by one stupid person. Mm. And have and, and had we gone, gone back, well, there were cases where Concord was in trouble uh, decades before, but the people weren't as stupid then, and so the stupid thing wasn't done. But mm. as, as 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 IQ declines, you get the greater possibility of a, of a person who is stupider and stupider and stupider doing a stupid thing, which has very serious consequences. Mm. Um, and Concord is an example of that. In fact, in most cases, when a plane crashes um, like that, it's it's a person that's made a stupid mistake, mm. uh, and, and and it's just more and more and more likely that planes will fall out of the sky as we get stupider and stupider and stupider it's the, the question is does does our ability to up, upgrade technology and make it safer outpace the growing stupidity and eventually the prediction is that as we get too stupid then it won't do that anymore and then we start to perhaps you know go go backwards because there's lots and lots of little mistakes being made um, all the time and, mm. and so actually you lose faith in something like air travel I mean, you've got to remember, in the 80s, a lot of people didn't want to fly because planes seemed to be falling out of the sky all the bloody time in the 80s. Mm. Um, and then and then it got a bit better. But yeah, you can you can people can lose faith in 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 the surety and in, in of, of certain technologies. And then and then you start to go um, you start to go backwards. But I, my, my, my concern about AI, the first is, is an AI virus. There's a very interesting article about this on in a magazine called Aporia. If you want to Google AI virus, very interesting. Um, and another another con another concern um, is that it, it doesn't stop the system. It doesn't keep keep us going. It, it will be a selection event to some extent, possibly even against stupidity. Um, in so much as I would expect, um, so, so that would actually be a eugenic thing in some ways. But then in other ways, not because it would select. It would it, you, you they would be more instinctive and just get pregnant or whatever. Whereas it would be the more intelligent that would be less instinctive and would be the sort of a character in the sky that would enter a and enter a weird universe 
So I think I think I think it would it, it it has the potential to be a selection event, but we're so early in it now that it's hard to make predictions, obviously. Yeah, it's it's I like the idea of when you when you read history, like um you, you think about the the like a, a herder or something, someone with their goats walking past some ruins in a, in Greece. And I think that a lot of the time when they saw those ruins, they assumed those must have been made by gods because, because there's no way they could have been made by man. And it's funny to think that potentially in 100, 150 I, uh, 50 years, 200 years, I don't know how long, that um, people could look at, you know, a, a plane sitting, sitting, you know, the ruin of a plane and think, who made these? Like, uh, what, you know, what, <laughs> what were they capable of? You know, they, it, it is a God, it is almost like a godlike, um, a godlike intelligence that made that, you know? And um, you could easily see how people in 200 years would look at that if that no longer existed and think, you know, it's the sort of stuff you can make religions about, I guess. Well, that's what they that's what they thought. So when you, you of course, after the Great Bronze Age collapsed, there was the Greek Dark Ages mm. uh, for about 800 years. And towards the end of the Greek Dark Ages, people would, people, you, you had these massive buildings uh, from a thousand years earlier, and people couldn't understand how they built them. And they would, they, and they assumed they were built by gods. Yeah, yeah and exactly. That, there's writing about that from the time. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, yeah, the Greek Dark Ages where they, yeah, exactly. So it's it's funny to think that that could potentially end up happening down the line with with but with instead of ruins of palaces it'll be um with planes and and skyscrapers or something. Yes, I mean it would it would t take about a thousand years, and after a thousand years, uh, what's going to be left? Uh, mm. The Hoover Dam, maybe, uh, bits of the Eiffel Tower. Um, yeah, you know, everything could be would be destroyed. There'd be hardly anything left. Because in a way well, that, that this is happening now, um, this process is occurring to a degree, and obviously it's occurring in slow motion. It's it's not as rapid, but it, but it would be occurring in a country like South Africa, where where I imagine if you lived in a country like South Africa, I'm 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 guessing here. I don't know much about it, but a lot of the things they took for granted now simply don't exist, right? So people within living memory, they go. We used to be able to do X. We used to be able to do Y. And now we can't. We used to be able to reliably catch a train. We used to be able to yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 then and then you notice that. But you, you imagine that that process could speed up. We have the same thing in the UK. You used to be able to ring up a doctor and see a doctor within a couple of days. Mm. Now you have to wait months. You yeah. used to be able to go to to the to the uh, accident emergency and see a doctor within about two hours. Mm -hmm. Now people are waiting six hours. Yeah. So, so within 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 living memory, on certain measures at least, things were better. Mm. That's for sure. All right. Well, thanks so much for speaking with me, uh, Professor Dunn. It's been a really interesting conversation. I really enjoyed the book, and um, hopefully, maybe in the future, I'll, I'll read another one of the books that you've written, and I could talk to you about that if you're open to that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you.